I mean, is it? It's like you get to a certain point in your career where it's like you. you this is. I mean, <laughs> this is like you just. To me, it just seems like you have like the perfect baseline career that you might have always wanted. You're playing blues. You're playing all over the world. You get your sticks when you get your sticks, and you get to just like jam with people and have fun. I mean, it's like it's got to be rad. Yeah, I mean, I mean, to be honest with you, it's like I, it's gone way further than I ever thought. I can um, imagine. And, you know, I mean, like I'm, I'm, I've been off for a couple of days and, you know, this weekend I have a charity gig here in Los Angeles for the midnight mission. And it's with Jackson Brown, Vince Gill, um, you know, all, all these like crazy people, talented people. And I'm like, this is my Sunday, you know? And it's like, it's like, I get to go jam with Jackson Brown and, and, and Albert Lee and people like that. And, it's it's a surreal life you know i collect guitars my whole life is a guitar sh show <laughs> yeah you know and and i and i do things like uh, it's just you know i i know i live a very unique life that is the envy of many guitar players and, and that's fine <laughs> i i yeah. work for it, you know i'm not saying other people didn't work for it, but but all this n craziness that you see is all coming out of here and it's because I'm not married and don't have to, 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 um, you know, hundred percent, dude, I, I am, I'm a single guy in his early forties, I guess 44 is mid forties at this point, mid, but it's Stay like, early. I, it, no, no, wait, I'm 47. I'm, I'm like in my late forties now because I'm one car lease away from 50. No, you're, no, you're, no, 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 dude. I, cause I think 44 to like, so I think like 40, yeah, I think mid is up until about 47. Late is 48, 49. Right. So I think there's a good window. Either way, either way, I'm in the same boat as you. I'm completely single, no kids, just doing stand-up. I go to concerts nonstop uh, when I have nights off. I hang out with friends. I go to movies. I buy shit I don't need, right. but I want, and it rules. And you don't have to answer. That's Thanks been for... the, the, you know, couple of, you know, Couple of things. I I I always say it's not them. I'm talking about my ex girlfriends. It's yeah. not them. It's me. I am so painfully consistent, like in my behaviors from when I've been been a kid till now, that a lot of times they will look at old videos of me when I'm a teenager being in show business, and, and they're going, "My God, you haven't changed at all since you were 13." I go, "Correct." And yeah. this is why this is why we're at an impasse. So, so you're never going to grow up and and mature and do anything. I go, not if I can help it, you know, and they're like, yeah. You know, and then the, some of the contrarians will say, it's like, well, you know, you, you're not married and you, 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 you don't have kids and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, cause I like discretionary income. You know, <laughs> I don't want to be beat down. I know people that are beat down from, from that life that they created and it's fine. My, my sister has two beautiful kids and I'm, I'm a great uncle and I'm happy. Yeah. It's great being an uncle. you come in, you 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 hang out with the kids. You buy them shit. You buy take them right. places, right. and then you're like, "I'm going back. I'm going back to a fun city. You guys stay here on the eastern shore of Maryland, where there's nothing to fucking do, and I'm gonna go back to where there's a Starbucks on every block because this yeah, place and, is killing me." And Uncle Joe, you know, it took him a while when they were growing up to figure out who Uncle Joe was. You know, because yeah. I'm the suit guy with the sunglasses, and now they they now they understand that it's, there's two different people. Um, but the best is, you know, because my, my sister's side of the family is Jewish and, and, you know, Hanukkah Harry comes in with the envelope, you know, <laughs> and I, and it's a Christmas, you know, Hanukkah mixed celebration and the envelopes get passed out and they love it. Five crisp $100 bills. They're, they're, they're living large, you know, and they, yeah. get, and they, and they generally save the money and they put it in the bank and it, and it's, it, it's, it's, that's the great thing about being an uncle is you don't have to, you know, worry about like all the problems that like, that, you know, like, like people worry about, you know, being a parent now. It's like, it's, it's such a treacherous minefield for my, my sister and brother-in-law that I just go, I don't know how you guys do it. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just a constant worry about something. Do any of like any of your, your nieces or nephews when they watch you, are they interested in music at all? Like, cause they, I, I have a lot of people like, cause you know, I, being that I play music, but then I also am a comic and mostly they see me like they've seen my shows to an extent as much as they can see. But it's like they're all like, 
they ask you questions or some of them are interested in the arts or any of them like trying to follow in your footsteps at all or like just you're the are you just the cool uncle that they think does the impossible well my my niece waverly is a very very talented uh, young musician and she's a singer she's a piano player and and she she sings great and is going to be very very successful and you know my job as uncle joe is to help her when she's ready to go out there because it's it you know it's treacherous it's not easy yeah. and the 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 chances of success are are almost like winning the lottery you know you just have to be tenacious and and do it and work put the work in but also make the right move so it's like when she's ready that's when you know that that's when i will you know help move the needle for her and because it you know it's you know trying to mitigate the mistakes that i made you know and everybody makes coming up is is super important you know yeah and and, and but the thing with with her she's got to love it you know and and you know th- th- at the end of the day every successful comic musician actor anybody in the arts loves it you know and and did it in their bedroom practice with the 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 the, the hairbrush and yep. you know oh yeah 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 your field or or whoever and and i was listening to eric clapton with the guitar and trying to mimic the, the riffs at the end of the day everybody starts that way you know how how the twists and turns in the career goes that that is up to you and a lot of hard work and good luck and 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 luck is part of it but you know at the end of the day we all started doing the same stuff it at, at the same time when we were kids the bug hit us if it, it's it's no different for eric clapton than it is for me or it's no different for ronnie dangerfield as it is for you you yeah. know you just, you yeah, just yeah, yeah. and and yeah. that's why you do it you know yeah. when the money and the fame come you know then then things start to get go off the rails and you're like it's like am i up here because i'm getting paid or am i up here because i because i still love it and you you got and you got to shake that off and make sure that you're you still love the what you did playing for free yeah and i mean look look i i don't you know i've only you know i of course i've known of you for a while and then of course i know your music but then it's like getting to know you this is only the second time we able to hang but but everything i read about you and and this is like the biggest compliment i could give you is that like is that like you really i mean you wouldn't collect guitars if you weren't obsessed with them and and it's like so which means you wouldn't do any of the shit that you're doing unless it was like oh this is my existence and i'm fine with that and i want that to be when i'm when i'm all said and done it's just like this dude not only loved the blues but loved every morsel of the the surrounding areas of it right yeah i, I mean i i've been a guitar geek since i've been a kid reading the books the wheeler book and all that stuff and you know just obsessed with fender and gibson guitars and 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 so 35 years four years into my career you know i i have one of the largest guitar collections in the world but it's not because I, i'm collecting stocks it's like yeah. i am that person yeah. I, I i am the mark you know and it's and it's i don't buy everything i'm pretty shrewd but at the end of the day, it really does, it, it does encapsulate who I am. And, yeah. and if I ever had to empty out this house, you'd be like, well, it, it, this doesn't seem like Joe. Of course it's filled with guitars. Of course it's OCD. <laughs> you know? yeah. Of course it's crazy and got blinking lights and signs and looks like a liquor store in the top of the world. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, 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 of course, because it makes sense. And, yeah. and you can only be who you are and and genuinely again you have to love it and if you don't love it you know then do something else you know or put the money in a 401k and forget about it you know yeah. and, and it's you know you know one of the worst questions anybody can answer it asks me and it's usually at a bar and it's, it's like that. it's usually it's usually some fucking nosy karen that 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 wants to step in and be the voice of reason and we'll say, ask me this question. It's like, why do you need all that stuff? And I said, if you have to ask that question, you don't know what it's like <laughs> to be a collector. You don't yeah, know. You don't. Yeah, exactly. Because you're not a collector. It's not, I'm not bragging. Somebody asked me. I don't start a conversation with, hi, I'm Joe Bonamassa and I, and I own 
whatever. <laughs> 4,000 okay? guitars. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I don't start that conversation. If it is brought up, I will, I will gladly in, you know, participate in the conversation. But, you know, if you, you know, if you, um, if you have, if you have to ask that question, then, then you don't have the collector gene, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's a, it's an addiction. It, it really is an addiction. Oh, I know. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and it's a, it's a tick. It's a, it's a psychiatric, you know, tick. That, Especially that, I, and, and not to, it. not at, Dude, not to like, I, I know what it's like. Is like, because there's certain things that you, whether it's like records or I love vintage t shirts, so I'm always looking and it's like, I'll see one online and I'll go, I'll go, oh man, all right, yeah, I want that. And then I'll go, eh, but I don't. And then I'll think about it and I'll think about it and it'll just stay that itch in the back of your head. And you're just like, right. you just get it. And you're like, all right, <laughs> you're like, you're only happy at the bar. I, I don't need, you don't need anything. You know what not I mean? Not at all. No. You need, you know, I, I see you have a, Lovely, well-maintained apartment with a roof over your head. I'm assuming you have running water and, and a bit of food in the refrigerator. That's you all you really assume, need. You would, you would assume day. that I have food in the refrigerator. You would assume, but I'm, don't forget, or, I'm a single you know, guy in a his couple 40s. of cases <laughs> of, of Progresso lentil soup and some ramen noodles. That's the, that that is my bug out kit. Okay, I got <laughs> yeah. ramen noodles for days. You know, yeah. but, but but generally, I, I generally eat out. Because yeah, you know it's it's cheaper to eat out for one. What am I cooking here? And yeah, oh, completely. For go, dude, completely. All right, Joe, meet Wayne Fetterman. Fetterman, meet Joe. Uh, first of all, <laughs> can you hear me? Okay, we got you. I sound, I sound. Okay. You sound good to me, Joe. Is he good to you? Absolutely. So Joe, I've I've actually, I've actually met Joe before. He's not going to remember because he was in the middle of a doing a show but it was at um on santa monica boulevard and we were doing a show with um you were doing a show with the lead guitarist of zz top um the troubadour a months ago. yeah the troubadour yeah i met you yeah. backstage there yeah. a lot of people were crowding around you at the time so uh well, it nice was to, uh, nice to see you again yeah that's the uh, the annual billy gibbons birthday bash yeah. at the yes. troubadour so. Oh, I love that. I said this before is that, you know, Billy Gibbons came on the podcast before uh, to do actually uh, Eliminator. So what like, like ZZ Top's most popular record and we do the thing and he's just the nicest guy. And at the end of the podcast, I go, Billy, thank you so much for coming on. And he goes, oh, man, that was a gas. And I go, that was the coolest thing anybody's yeah. ever said. A gas. Oh, just melted my heart. You know, this the is thing about Gibbons is is all of those. It's 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 all him. You know, I remember pulling up to Crossroads, the Eric Clapton's Guitar Festival in 2010, and in the backstage, there are these like Salvador Dali, you know, impressionist four by twelve cabinets, and I just go, it's got to be Gibbons, and there they were. They were there. Yeah. You know, it's like it, it all comes out of his mind. You know, and 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 he's the most cool eccentric cat I've ever met and he's still that guy and he still pushes the boundaries and if you sit down and talk to him about the blues he will school you I mean he and music I mean he will school you he, he knows all the deep stuff and and knows what to listen to and it's like that's a musicologist and a very very intelligent human and 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 I obviously has everybody's respect but 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 i was like wow this guy's a serious cat so so here's what's funny it would be a good starting off point of why it, you know so wayne is probably my most you've been on it how many times like 14 any 10 10 all right well i thought i added no no, no no it's more than 10 it's more than 10. yes but anytime there's a record that we're like who do we get and we search and and we can never but he because wayne knows he knows rock and roll. He knows blues. Uh, and so originally, before we had you, Joe, it was going to be Wayne. I threw it to him. And then Emily got in touch with you. And I was like, well, we got to have fucking Joe. And then yeah. and, and then we we're like, let's get Wayne on here, too. And because here's the deal. And I, this is the perfect starting off point. And call me, call me an idiot. Call me someone that doesn't know that much about blues. I had never heard of John Mayall and the Blues Breakers before. I had no idea that Eric Clapton played with this guy. Of course, I know it. Clapton, he, he's you know, Clapton is God. We've gone over him so many times on this 
rec on the podcast, whether it be cream, whether it be, uh, you know, uh, mainline Florida and, and all the different stuff that we've gone through. So, so this is like really my first experience digging in to John Mayall. And I said, what a better way than to have a real blues legend and then a blues theologist, comedian. if comedian, theologist, was theologist the right word? Kind of. I don't know if I'm a theologist, but I, I do love that era of music. As you know, I'm a guitar hero guy. So this, yes. is, this is where it all came out of. And uh, yeah, and I'm just thrilled to ask Joe a million questions because he knows the album inside and out. I've heard him play Hideaway. I've heard him play it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so Lee, go ahead. honestly, you know, when, when you talk about John May on the Blues Breakers, you know, if you're in a conversation at, at the Chateau Marmont and you're talking to your, you know, peers and, and girls that you want to impress, you, like, and you're like, oh, you're into the blues. The first thing you should say is, oh, I, I got into, you know, Lead Belly and, and Sun House and, and Robert Johnson, which I actually share a birthday with Robert Johnson. Nice. That's what you should say. If you're a suburban white kid in your 40s, guess how you, you got introduced to the blues? John May on the Blues Breakers or Eric Clapton. And that's it. You go to London before you go to Chicago. And and that's really what encapsulates that record. And those three records that he made with 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 Clapton, uh, Peter Green, and, and Mick Taylor. It's like everybody, every suburban white kid learned how to play blues from the Beano album. I mean, it's like the Beano. that was standard ops, you know. It's this record, so this record's massive then. This is this is a landmark it, blues record it, in the scope of everything. Please take me, guys, take me there because I know nothing. I can read my shit or I can listen to two guys that I respect more than anything. Well, let me ask Joe a couple of questions because uh, again, that record wasn't huge in the United States as a seller or anything, but it was just huge for blues aficionados. Is that correct? I think it, you know, I mean, was it, is it certified diamond? Probably not. Um, right. But I know, I, I don't know anybody in my circle of friends um, mm -hmm. who doesn't have it. And, you know, when you do the deep dive on Clapton, oh, yeah. you, you eventually get there, you know? Right. And my, my dad uh, played that record for me when I was a kid. Because I really loved 461 Ocean Boulevard. I loved like mm -hmm. the like the kind of Marcy Levy uh, era Clapton when he was trying to be Don Williams and and further on up the road and yep. stuff like that, you know. And you know his cover of Bobby Bland. And he's like, you got. By the gotta way, listen. Bobby Blue Bland is now Josh knows about him. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Did we did it. We did it. We did it. He on had the never heard of which it. Which Wayne came on and did, dude. I'm telling you, any time, because like actually, our producer wrote like the you. This is your twelfth appearance. Uh, uh -huh. Random facts about the number twelve. Twelve men have walked on the moon. A group of twelve things is called <laughs> a, a Dota cane. Besides a dozen, and under British law, you can legally buy a pet at the age of twelve. So there's a lot of good things. <laughs> really? And then, I, and yeah, this is what I mean. Well, I don't know. This is what Adam got me. Um, so, so is this, so what era of Clapton is this? Because it just feels like, you know, I, I don't know, like where in his career does he somehow, this is what 66, like, where is he, is this, is this pre cream after cream? Like it's pre, right? Yes. Okay. It's pre cream. But what's interesting to me is he had left the Yardbirds because that band was too poppy. And then he kind of floated around a little and. You know, John Mayall just died. And did you see the uh, little video that Eric put up about John online, Joe? Yeah, I saw it. It was really, really, really touching. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, a couple of things. I, I, I interviewed John uh, when I was oh, doing really? my podcast, when, when, when all, all, all guitar players during the pandemic had become content creators. <laughs> as soon as I went back to work, I'm like, fuck this shit. I'm out. I don't want to add to the noise. Right. <laughs> so they're like, why don't you do live from the anymore? I'm like, I am not a broadcaster. Okay. I played one on TV just to quote, stay relevant. And, um, <laughs> and I interviewed John. One of, one of the, one of the coolest interviews that I did was John Mayall. And I asked him, I said, I said, you know, why, how did you manage the band? And he goes, Joe, I couldn't keep a guitar player. Clapton would come in and out, you know, and he drew the biggest crowd because he was a member of the Yardbirds. So when John had Clapton in the band in 66, he, you know, playing Hampstead, he would draw a bigger crowd than Peter Green, 
you know, and then Peter leaves to form Fleetwood Mac and he gets Mick Taylor and it's night and in 72, he's gone. Right. He couldn't keep a guitar, player. this poor guy couldn't keep a band together. And, but he had such an eye for talent and, and, and those three guitar players, Peter, Mick and, and, and Eric Clapton really all at that time kind of sounded similar, you know, Clapton kind of paved the way for, for, for that Les Paul through a Marshall, cranked blues rock thing that we all chase to this day and you know john was the band leader he had the best record collection he had you know he lived here in laurel canyon and and right. was and really he was older than all those guys right he was like correct. 10 years old. yeah 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 and he was like the him and alexis corner and graham bond those were right. like the three pioneers of british blues they just dug it and then the kids dug it because they're they never heard any they never heard of Holland Wolf until the Stones brought them, right. you know. And so very few people were into the blues in the UK. And then the movement started, and John was right in the middle of all that, and and can are I, arguably the most successful. Can I ask you this? Because I just think it's always fascinating, and Josh of I spoke about it that that maybe the whitest people on earth, the English. Like yeah. embrace this Chicago blues, black music that came up from you know the Delta. Del yeah. Why do you think that was, Joe? Like that. Well, the 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 thing is, I think the better question is why 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 didn't we embrace it? Okay. Hmm. Why, why did the English embrace it and and we don't? And I can answer this because I experienced this. Mm -hmm. People from other countries tend to have blinders on to the cultural, you know, uh, contributions of their own. They take uh, it for like, granted. Yeah. Like when right, I yeah. went to, when I went to the UK first 25 years ago, okay. I immediately drew a crowd because I was American playing British blues. Now there was a whole crop of people in the UK that were just as good playing British blues. Couldn't draw a crowd. I come over as the, you know, you know, the Boston Tea Party of blues guitar players. <laughs> and 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 next thing you know, I'm playing the Royal Albert Hall. Conversely, in the 60s, Albert King was making records. B.B. King was making records. Howlin' Wolf was making Muddy, all, everybody. Sun House was still around. You know, and, and everybody just was like, through a blind eye. Next thing you know, the Stones come over and they're playing Howlin' Wolf songs. And, and naming their band after a Muddy Water song. And then the kids come out going, this music's revolutionary. You're like, it's been here all the, it's been hiding in plain sight. I got you, I got and you. Culturally, yeah. people culturally, you know, and it was a, it was also a, a very tough time, civil rights, you know, you know, for for America. And, and sometimes people just throw a blind eye to it and you're like, hey man, it's been here all along, you know? And then the hippies, you know, in the late 60s, started to embrace B.B. King and Albert. And, and next thing you know, they're drawing the big, biggest crowds of their, their careers because everybody just woke up. And and B.B. Right. always thanked Eric for, for, for you know, letting letting what? him, you know, for, for, for putting some, I don't know, notoriety to the blues in America because it helped them, helped everybody. Did you ask uh, John at all about when Eric lived in the attic and would go through the record collections and just practice all day like that? I'm fascinated by that. He this mentioned is, that. Yeah, he did. He mentioned that, and 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 that was like again, everybody has a to quote John Mayer. Uh, everybody has a host, and um, mm -hmm. and and my my father was the host. He was like, check this record out, check this record out, and next yeah, thing you yeah, know, yeah. you're hooked. You're hooked. You can't you can't get it out of your head. That's all you want to do. Get home from school, throw the book bag in the closet, and 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 put on Robert Cray records or, or Clapton records. You know, and and right. once once you get hooked and the seed is planted, it's hard. It's really really hard to get. And get, get, just for those who don't it. know this album, don't. How is this different than let's say? Those Yardbirds records that Josh yeah. and I talked about a, a little bit. How was how was Eric different on this than he was on Five Yard Live Yard? You know those ones. Spite. 
You ever think about that? Like, <laughs> Wait, what I, do you I mean? What, is he mad or what? Is it like because he he's like the fuck, he's like he's like fuck the Yardbirds type shit? Is that what you're saying? He got out of the Yardbirds with a chip on his shoulder. <laughs> and when oh, you okay. hear when you listen all, when you hear when, right off the bat, all your love track one. You, th- that that is a guitar player on fire with something to prove, and he wanted to play blues and he was inspired and never discount spite. As a is a great motivator, you know. It's it's. Inter- you know. I always thought that was an interesting track to lead off that album, considering "For Your Love," which is almost the same exact, was the song that he left the Yardbirds over, right? Correct. For your love, and then obviously all your love is is Otis Rush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and, a blues. You know, and then and then Hideaway. Would you say that's the premier solo on that record. No. Oh. The best one is double crossing them. Oh, that's okay. that's yeah, yeah. that that is un, unbelievable. I mean, stepping out, great. Mm-hmm. You know, hideaway, um, little girl. I mean, that's that solo on little girl. It's like it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's killing. There, By the way, a reason, gosh. yeah. There's oh, a reason ahead. why people I, want fifty nine less Pauls, and they pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for them. If this this is the record that started that. Because the sound of the guitar is this is mm-hmm. all their play. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, what were you about to say, uh, Wayne? No, I was just saying this is the era when those signs, those graffiti around London started saying Clapton is God were yeah. popping up. That's how po- crazy people were for what Eric Clapton was doing. Is that correct, Joe? Yeah, that was he was the man. And, uh, you know, he was the number one guitar player in the U.K., because of the Yardbirds, obviously, and you know, closely followed by by Jeff Beck and Pete Townsend, and then this right. guy Chaz right. Chandler brings this kid over from Seattle, yeah, and and fucks them all up, and right. you know, James Marshall Hendrix shows up and and uh, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, makes everybody feel very small, and which brings us back to Billy Gibbons, because didn't Gibbons play a little with Hendrix or jam? Yeah, with him? yeah, he did. The moving sidewalks, yeah, yeah, in, yeah, in New yeah. York, and you know that there's that great photo of Billy with with Jimmy, and he's Jimmy's playing Billy Strat, and that's like you know, right, pretty pretty epic stuff, you know. So so, so 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 my question is, all right, so 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 Eric leaves the Yardbirds. How does right. he? What is where is so how who is John like, and how does John is like? How did they? He decide to start working with this guy. And is this the first John? This isn't the first John Mayall record because I see John Mayall plays John Mayall in '65, and I don't know. Is there? I think that was the first one, and then it's Blues Breakers. Yeah. And by the way, like, after he did that album, John plays John. He yeah. lost his recording tr- contract. Like pe- people were not buying that album at all. And then when he signs Eric Clapton, Decca was like, "Let's let's uh, let's g- get these guys." Like that's how powerful that. Eric was what twenty at this time? Twenty one, yeah. Like he was just a phenom. maybe twenty two, yeah. May, yeah, just a phenom at that time. So that's how they got that rec- that record. If I'm not mistaken, that's uh, and and Mike Vernon had a lot to do with that too. Mike Vernon was a producer, pretty pretty, yeah. pretty powerful producer at the time mm-hmm. in 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 the UK. And you know, it, it's just the stars aligned. It, you know, it's like it's. I, you know, I don't think there was much forethought. It was just like, there, here, you want to do rambling on my mind? Sure. You want to do hideaway? <laughs> sure. What do you know? Sure. We got we got two days. Sure. You know, and it, it's those are the great records to me. It's like you know, not the ones that that you know. You know. Do you think that um, hideaway is why he wanted to use a, a Les Paul because that's on the cover of Freddie's album? Yeah, Freddie used the Les Paul. Right. Um, he used the Gold Top. And mm-hmm. then he went to the 345. And then yeah, ultimately the 355. This is what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I love it. A little sidebar. It was like in 2015, yes. I, I did a I did a, a, a tour called the, mm-hmm. the, the the Three Kings. And we did yeah. Freddie, B, BB, and Albert, right? Great. Oh my to the point of which probably why I'm not married and and have problems in 
with relationships with women is what I did was on the cover of that album, you can see Freddie has two knobs missing. So I had the 54 gold top and I took the two knobs off to look like Freddie's guitar to the, to the other thing is we lined up the little pointers that go under the knobs the same way that was on the record. Oh, Only wow. I noticed that's how that's, but the less Paul, when it comes to Clapton is probably because of, of, of Freddie and, and those, those 59 less Pauls, those sunburst less Pauls were not readily available. It was maybe two or three in the country. Keith Richards had the first one and the word got out that they sounded good. Peter Green had one and there's only like, you know, half a dozen in the country and they all went to the pros and that sound through the Marshall didn't sound like Freddie King. It sounded like the blues break. Right. And did Freddie King use a Vox amplifier? Just, I know we're deep diving. Uh, well, like Leon Russell era, Freddie, he used a quad, which is basically oh, okay. a 412 twin. Um, you could see him on in the early 60s. He's playing through anything that, that that's there, you know, right. and probably you. use some sort of Fender amp or whatever, whatever is available. Um, well, Josh, you know. Josh, this is a crazy thing about the Les Paul was, again, all the, the top guys were using them in the late 50s. And if I'm not mistaken, they were selling so few of those guitars that they canceled production of them. Is that right? For right. a number of years. Wow. From 1960 to 1968. Um, the no, 59 no Les, Les Paul, Paul the, the, once 1960 rolled around, Gibson said, to less like this thing is not selling anymore. They tried to put sunburst finishes, flame tops, try to get people to buy them. And Les's star had kind of he wasn't a big as big a star as he was in the early 50s, and they were selling less and less. So they they made this double cutaway that kind of looked like a stratocaster called the solid guitar. And it's mm -hmm. the acronym is SG. And yeah. they were originally in 1960, 61, 62 were called Les Paul standards and customs, and they look like SGs. Once Les bailed in 63, he, then they, they become the solid wow. guitar. And then in 68, they reissued the gold top, which was stupid because everybody wanted a sunburst one. They should have just started making sunburst ones again. And, and a Les Paul custom with a maple top, not an old mahogany body like they made in the 50s. You see why I don't get laid, fellas? <laughs> Oh, there's a woman awesome. out there that's digging all this shit, dude. And then, <laughs> you know, and, and then and then the rest is history. But by 1972, a 59 Les Paul standard was they were trading for around 750 to a thousand dollars. Given the fact that they were 269 brand new, everybody's going thousand bucks. By 1980, they were four thousand um, dollars. Right, top of the heap. And by 1990, they were 25,000, 30,000. By 2000, they were over 150. And now, if you got a real nice one, you can put a four in the first number. It's a, it's a fucking house. Wow. I know. And, wow. Let me ask you another question because this album, it's called the Beano album because that's the name of yeah. the comic strip that Eric is reading in a very dismissive way on the cover of that, uh, that uh, the Blues Breakers album. Um, oh. I joke. Is this the first time a Les Paul is plugged into a Marshall amp? And tell us a little about, I always thought it was interesting that Les Pauls were American made, Marshalls were English made, that it was an incredible like convergence that created this, this sound. Well, Jim Marshall had a, a music store and mm -hmm. he was building amplifiers. In London? In, in London? In London? Yeah, and, okay. and I don't know exactly what neighborhood London's so vast, but the, the, right. the comment section will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> the, he had a music store and he befriended yeah. a guy named Pete Townsend and he was built. He was a drummer, but he knew how to build amps. And his first amp, 1962, the, the Jim JTM 45, which uh, uh, stood for Jim and Terry Marshall, 45 watt. And it's basically a 410 late 50s fender basement with english parts and two 12s and then he had the idea of putting everybody wanted louder 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 so he was like let's put let's make a cabinet that's 412s and in certain really rare examples 812s and they would stick the head on and yeah. then they would just turn it all the way up and then it distorted and whatever 
And then he, Pete Townsend asked him in like 65 for a louder amp. So he made the, the, the JTM 100 and which was uh, the, just basically a, a high powered twee twin with English tubes and parts. And they had a unique sound. And when you, again, it was probably just because of availability. It was like, of the well, parts. Jim makes amps, and I got this Les Paul. Let's plug it in, and uh, we're gonna put a mic in front of it, and that's okay. it. And then the the legend's born, and then everybody chases it for, you know, sixty years. Just a quick sidebar. I know this is off the track. Why do you think Eric Clapton? I mean, obviously you know him. Uh, switched over to um, Fender guitars after creating this crazy brown woman sound? I think it was, he was trying to get as far away from cream. Is, I'm just oh, guessing as, uh -huh. as, as he possibly could. He needed a sea change. And, right, 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 right. You know, I mean, he still played, he played Explorers. He had a couple of uh, Karina Explorers in the 70s. He he had the uh, he had the Les Paul Custom that, that he used with the Delaney and Bonnie and Friends. Mm -hmm. um, but generally by 1970. Five, it was the strap, right? And you know, Derek and the Dominoes and the first Clapton solo album would let it rain. It was right. like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go from using big Marshall stacks to the smallest amps I can find, which is like Princeton's Fender Princeton's and Champs. Yeah, and that's when yeah. Tom Dowd got involved. And and remember Tom, we just we talked about Tom Dowd, the oh yeah, guy with the Manhattan Project, Columbia. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's yeah, what, Tom, yeah. what a, you know. Go ahead. And, and Tom told me all this when, when he, he produced did my first. Post. He, yeah, he produced my first solo album, which turned out to be mm -hmm. his last full length album before he unfortunately passed away. And of course, I'm going to ask him. You know, like what what, what was the gear? Because he he yeah. recorded Cream in '67 at the Atlantic right. Studios, you know, on mm -hmm. Broadway, and he recorded you know Derek and the Dominoes at Criteria. He goes he goes because Cream you couldn't hear the drums because they'd set up the stacks in the studio and. Poor Ginger had to deal with it. And, you know, Derek and the Dominoes, he had to use the preamps on the on the console because the, the, they were playing such low volumes. And that that also creates a sound. And, you know, I mean, it was he did he did a lot. I mean, with, you know, I mean, when it, talking about Mayall, you know, you can hear that sound develop from the Beano album to Fresh Cream to the, the live adventures at the Winterland with, with Cream. And you're like, yeah, that's it's pretty much, uh, you know, direct link to that, you know, whether he had the SG or the or the Sunburst Les Paul or the 335, pretty much a delineation of, of what he the sound he created with with. Um, with Do John. you think even being able to record bands at that high of volume was would be possible without what Tom did in New York and what they what they were kind of figuring out? I know Jimmy oh, that, Page had trouble with it when he produced that. Well, was... The the engineers who were you know at the time were used to recording Burl Ives, okay, <laughs> you know, and and the London Philharmonic going, well, these these long haired kids are crazy, like absolutely crazy. Like, like, right. Can't turn it up that loud. Turn it down. And they're like, this is what this is what it sounds like. And they 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 took a lot of that from Buddy Guy. Buddy Guy was the first guy to just go. All the way up, and, and Buddy Guy is also the reason we t we brought this up with Josh is the reason Cream is a three person band, correct? I'm not yeah. sure, is it? Yeah, because Eric Clapton saw him as like, oh, I can do this with three people, as opposed right. to four with the Yard or five or whatever they had, and uh, wow. But yeah. you know, I mean, it's think about what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. 1965 to 1970 that's five years it's not a long time considering that the that 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 next year january will be the fifth anniversary of the world shut down in the in covid doesn't seem like that long ago but no, all of right. that music that we're still talking about today was created in those five years cream the Beano album jeff beck group yeah Blind Early Faith. Zeppelin, all of the right. Jimi hendrix shit right except for the stuff he did in 70 okay right and because he died in August of seven, and I mean, just just insane stuff. That right, I always thought five yeah. years. Even and that's Derek a convergence of both. 
go go ahead. That was a conversion to both talent and, in my opinion, technology. Both recording technology, the amplifiers, those guitars. They kept getting songs. better every year. That's and songwriting. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course. The but, Beatles. Uh, I mean, look at the Beatles. I mean, it's yeah, like, all, you know, and, and it's like, it, it, it just, we'll never see that again. Like we live in an era of, of, of it's, it's too processed to, right. to, to ever recreate what happened in London and New York and, and even out here in Laurel Canyon, um, you know, the mamas and the papas and the, and the birds and the Crosby stills in Nash, all that stuff. And the Joni Mitchell, which whose house is just over here. And, you know, it, it, you're never going to see that again because we live, it, it's, it's, I think we just, it, we require so much less dynamics in the music for it to be popular. Mm -hmm. And right, right. It, it's, it's to, in order to compete both in rock and in pop, you have to really just, just, just slam it, just pin it all the way to the top and mm -hmm. put as much information in the first 30 seconds as you, you can. And song, songs like Sweet Judy Blue Eyes would not would not be no. on the radio today. You know, it's just it it's just not. It would be, there would be a cult following for it, but but as far as it being popular music, no. Can I loop back to the Beano album for one question? Yeah, Another dude, question. please, dude. Wait, this is, dude, dude, go whatever direction. I'm loving this, dude. Okay. <laughs> you Joe, guys got this. As somebody who like came to Eric Clapton through long time long you know when cocaine and the, that miami sound what was your reaction when you heard like the bino album and cream because i assume you heard those after you heard long tall yeah. sally uh, yeah it, i didn't like it I tell like, me why not, i'm like seven years old right yeah my yeah, dad's yeah. Like, check this out you know because right at that point i was you know like like all kids that were into this kind of music, not many of us, but all kids. <laughs> it was Stevie Ray Vaughan had just come out in '82. Oh, I see. Oh, wow, that and, late. Okay. You know, I mean, and 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 we we're. I was listening to Stevie's first album, and then I was listening to Eric Clapton. It was all. I was a big Strat guy. Everything had to be Stratocaster. And then when I heard John Mayall, I was like, this doesn't sound like a Stratocaster. This doesn't sound like Eric Clapton at all. And right. and then when I was about eleven or twelve, I I put on the Jeff Beck group truth yeah. and the let first, me that's the, the, the first album, love you, right? the first yeah. the first the first album after he split from the yard birds it's another spite album um <laughs> you can hear it i love um, it and and let me love you baby the second yeah. song i was like what is that and I, I i i had a conversation with ken scott who engineered the record mm -hmm. and at abbey road and I said, how did you get that big, fat Les Paul sound um, uh, uh, on the beginning of Let Me Love You, baby? Because he goes, Jeff's amp was so loud, we put it in the closet, and the mic was outside the closet. It was a drum mic. Happy really? accident. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah because, yeah. because this Abbey Road wasn't designed for that. They designed that studio in the 30s for, for orchestras and broadcasts. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and... You know, once I heard Jeff Beck group, then I was like, the, the the male stuff made way more sense to me. I was like, well, this is this is part. Of and this then movie. did you get to the Yardbirds? Is then like, what was your? Then I got to the Yardbirds. The Yardbirds. Yeah. You know, for me, Train Kept a Rolling was was my favorite song. Mm -hmm. um, it was a little bit Brit pop for me. You know, mm -hmm. as, as influential as it was, it was a little bit Brit pop. And then I, you know, the new Yardbirds floored me. You know, AKA. Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, that first album, you're like, that is blues rock perfection, you know, and you're just, and it's a blues album, you know, how many more times look out that, I mean, you can yeah, feel yeah. the ground shaking, you know, it was, it was a perfect band, you know, Robert and John and, you know, John Paul Jones and, and Jimmy at the helm producing it, you know, just all, all at the top of the game because those guys were session guys, you know, Robert and John, we're from the black country, but 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 John Paul Jones and Jimmy Page, oh. they were session guys. The beginning of uh, the the guitar riff on uh, Joe Cocker's uh, 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 have a get a, little uh, help. get a little help for my friends. Yeah. That's Jimmy Page, 
playing it. right and you know hurdy gurdy man that's all it's all page and john paul jones and they all they knew each other and so the, their skill set was pretty honed in the studio because they were doing tom jones games for joe meek you know yeah yeah or goldfinger right yeah yeah like, what, i mean what a what a I mean, if you just if you did the deep dive on Jimmy Page's sessions, that's a career yeah. in itself, right there. You know, he doesn't really advertise that too much. He will talk about it in interviews, but he doesn't really advertise that like he's. You've heard him before Zeppelin a lot, and he also started producing before Zeppelin. He had produced yeah. some. Have you heard Eric Clapton's? It's with this weird band with Steve Winwood on vocals. The earlier version of Crossroads. No. Okay. Before right. Blind Faith? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Before Blind Faith, he did a version of Crossroads with Stevie Winwood on vocals. Uh, it doesn't matter. It was just, I, I mean, thought. A, I mean, what a singer. <laughs> to this day. I mean, Winwood. Oh, Steve Winwood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. all of those bands couldn't last. I have a hunch it's Eric Clapton. <laughs> I have a hunch. <laughs> that's my that's my hunch. Well, you know, you ever hear the Peter Green story about why they named the band Fleetwood Mac? No. Oh, so it's to keep that he, guy in there, right? Yeah. He told he he basically said it out loud. You know, bands were so fluid back in the it wasn't it wasn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. It's like let me make a record, maybe we'll maybe start another band. It was like it, it was, everything was so fluid and people would, you know, jump ship. He goes, I want to name it Fleetwood Mac after the drum drummer and the bass player. And because, <laughs> keep because when I when I split they'll have something to fall back on in a, in a, in a name. And it, and <laughs> we did split, you know, and that's why they named it Fleetwood Mac. It was because, by the way, Josh, the, the Fleetwood Mac is an insane story because they were like this blues band for years, multiple albums. And then when they became, how would you describe when they broke through, uh, when they, was it more of a pop sensibility? Well, Buckingham Knicks, if you li listen yeah. to that record that they did at Sound City. Oh, okay. Okay. It's pretty much the the the, the sound. It, it's pretty much the 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 tablet and, and the structure of what would become rumors, you know. Right. And they they were just looking to get hits. They wanted hits, and boy, they got them. You yeah. know, because rumors is like the <laughs> furthest thing from blues that I've ever heard. So you hear, I knew that Fleetwood Mac had a life before that, but oh, huge years, right? Yeah, and then and then the the introduction of Christy McVie, and and yeah. and that those harmonies and the SoCal thing that was happening out here, and okay. you know, and it's it's very hard to and and the fact that they were so toxic among themselves, you know writing songs about each other you know yeah. you can go your own way fuck you well that's my bandmate right there <laughs> she's singing <laughs> it too, you know dude that rules yeah but it's weird that that band has its roots in john mail it does it all does it and you know one of the things i've been screaming like yeah. to anybody who would listen over at the rock and roll hall of fame is can right. we please please pretty please sugar on top even if you have to do another like a a, a, a pre telecast ceremony, can we please get John Mayall in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame before he dies? And sadly, he's not going to live to see. He didn't live to see the ceremony, but he did live to see hear the news. Mm -hmm. And 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 him and uh, Alexis Corner going it, which which was a big surprise to me. Uh, I'm like, yeah, without those guys, the rock and roll would sound a lot different today. And, what and, so the, so not to cut you off, but what what is it about John and or like the Yardbirds that that helped them serve as this stepping stone for the legendary guitar players? What is it about the that attracted with they just trying to do the the like you said that Delta Blues sound or that they were just the the only people that were doing it in London or like why why is it is everybody playing with them? Because they were the hip kids. That's oh. the best record collection. Everybody wanted to be in the in the in the blues breaker. You know, every guitar player. I mean, Peter Green, I think, saw an ad in Melody Maker. John Mayall and the Blues Breakers looking for a guitar player. And he called him because he wanted to be in. And he learned how to play like Eric Clapton just just to do the game. You know, and it's it's all those, uh, you know, there was such a such a movement. Everybody wanted their name is God 
painted on a wall, you know, and that right. was, that's how influential that music was. And, you know, they're playing the Marquee Club in London. You know, were, you know some of those great posters and, and bills. You know, everybody was there, you know, and, and, and they would all go see each other. The Stones would go well, see we, Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles would see Hendrix and the, the Who. Then they would all borrow from each other going, hey, I like this gimmick. I don't like that one. Let's let's do something different. And friendly competition among their peers really elevated the music in those five years. And John was right there. He just didn't. Did you John feel like John was it, You know. Did you feel like John was upset when Eric left to form Cream? I don't think he was. I think he just was concerned. I mean, this is what he told me. He was, I was just yeah. concerned getting a band together, you know. Jesus. But mm -hmm. but he ran into three great guitar players right off the bat. He's had a, you know, <laughs> Clapton, Peter Green, and Mick Taylor, right off the bat, you know, and and kept him going. Yeah, yeah. he's an issue. He was an issue. I'm sorry, I can't believe you got to speak to him. What a! It's just I, a legendary uh, album, obviously, and it's also interesting. And maybe Joe, you could like. I felt like Clapton, Page, and Beck all. They're not from London. They're from some place called Surrey County. Like mm -hmm. a different area, so it's just interesting, like that they all came from that area, almost like yeah, the Lennon and, McCartney thing. It, and, and you know, if you look at the Black Country, like around Birmingham, you got the, mm -hmm. the Bonhams Plant, Ozzy Osbourne, Tony Iommi, you know, all that stuff that that's was working class. That's a very working class industrial area, right? And you you have to understand, you can't discount the fact that it was also post war, and and a lot of the a lot of London and Birmingham. I mean, it was pretty bombed out and it took them right. all 20 years, 25 years to, to, you know, to, to dig out from under the world war two. So these, these, these 20 year old kids are going, I, I, I got to get a better life. I can't just end up in the factory. So they're playing their way out of Birmingham and they're playing their way out of Surrey and they wanted, they wanted it. And then when, you know, they heard, the Good Beatles point. went to New York and then, you know, God forbid they get their, you know, all the English cats, as soon as they, they, they landed in California, they're like, Oh my God, this is paradise. I'm not going back. You know, you can't make me, you know? So and, in a way, Hitler's bombing of England inspired this whole generation. Interesting. Interesting. Well, it's, it's, if you ever notice some of the richest rock stars are tend to be cheap because right. post-war rationing, you know, they don't oh, right, know where right, the next right. Hundred million pounds is coming from, so it's 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 a good it's good to be frugal, you know. All right. Also, I, another I, I witnessed that. You did. Yeah. Oh wow! I'll pick. I'll take. I'll take the check. <laughs> By the way, back to this album. Back to this album. Take us there. They do a cover of what I say on that album, right? Yes. Yeah, that's the um, Ray Charles um, song. Yeah, the, the Ray Charles hit. With maybe one of the worst drum solos I've ever heard on one of the greatest guitar albums of all time. What's your take <laughs> on that drum solo? Um, it was in the spirit of the song. You know, <laughs> it's not all gold. You know, right, right, right. Um, was it Ainsley Dunbar played on the? It was. It was it. It was it. It was it. Ainsley Dunbar no. played drums on the blues. Uh, no, I maybe oh. I can't think of the guy's name, but I don't want to. Well, there, there was there was a couple of guys, Mick, Mickey Waller, who played with the Jeff Beck group. He played a lot uh -huh. of, on a lot of stuff. Ainsley Dunbar was in the mix. Um, yeah, I think sure. it was. Yeah, Angie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's but right. But you got to think, though. Right. Come on, fellas. Time is money. Yeah. Oh, I, I, can I? Can I? And, and there was no Pro Tools. Hey, can I just get that drum solo again? No, I actually like my vocal and guitar solo. Thank you very much. We're moving on. Yeah, we're moving on. I, I'm, I'm trying to get Adam to pull it up right now because I want to. I want to hear how bad it is. I don't remember it. Uh, it's, no, it's just it's interesting. Like right in the middle of this, like it crazily influential album that every guitar hero guy knew about. The reason, right. like, yeah, <laughs> is this insanely? <laughs> you know, when this is the air, you know, Ginger Baker's around at the time. There's like some really good drummers, so it's. Yeah, Ginger was the guy. I mean, he was. Oh yeah, he was. He was on another planet. And, well, he's you know, a jazz. That's the jazz rock merge, yeah. right? 
Mitch Mitchell as well, and, yeah. and Charlie Watts, and uh, the the they they were jazz drummers, you know. These were and jazz drummers. They were Is jazz that the drummers. Last, that's, that's probably the last of the jazz rock drummers, right? That that crew. Well, I mean Billy Cobham, um, you know. It's, it, the stratus you know like with the, the spectrum record is you know right, that's right, jazz right, right. right and, right right i mean they were talking about like fusion era which where chops were king you know you had mm -hmm. to have chops and you get into dennis chambers and dave weckle and you know all all these insanely tell you to gad first of all joe you are your knowledge is incredible on all of this stuff i know you do the self-deprecating this is why i can't get a date i understand all of that but it's just I know a little about a lot yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 okay but it's okay. awesome yeah you know you definitely know a lot and you were the one if i'm not mistaken that's there's this great legend about that guitar and that was stolen correct and right you're like the main it's whenever i see an article about it they quote you why how did that happen is that wrong i i don't i've never seen it so I don't want to start the the fire again. I've never yeah, yeah. seen it. I've heard rumors where it is, and and, yeah. and heard rumors that it's been hiding in plain sight. You know, it, it's got some. You know, John would have had more photos. There's not many photos of the '59, or because we don't even know if it's a '59. But it, it looks like a '59. Right. There was guitar. an argument whether it was '59 yeah. or '60. Wait, wait, what is the guitar? Just so I'm caught up of what's going on. Like I, I, like I'm very you know, interested right now. Paul is is the, the alleged 59 Les Paul that Clapton had during this era that was stolen at a gig and he oh. never got it back. Oh, um, okay. And he, it, it's, you know, it's somewhere. And I'm not sure if, even if uh, Eric would recognize it, you know what I mean? Cause it's like mm -hmm. 60 years ago and he ended up getting um, a 1960 Les Paul. Um, from Andy Summers, aka the oh. Summers Burst, and that's and then, and then there was a '58 that traded. He traded to Paul Kossoff for a custom, and you know, he had multiple Sunburst Les Pauls in that in that time frame. But everybody chases the Beano guitar because there's only a handful of pictures, and actually some had re, some new photos of it resurfaced of of them playing the Marquee or some club. And you can clearly tell it's the guitar because it has a double white coil in the front and a double black coil in the back. And okay. but the fingerprint is the wood is they're all different. And there's no clear pictures of what the wood is. So you, the you, grain you, of the wood, the, the grain, grain of the wood. wood. Yeah. yeah. OK. And and it, it appears to be a 59 plane top or it could be an early 60, which is basically the same. Ah, very good. See, that would be. That's a the different summer. one, right? That's the stump. That's the summers. You can see the yeah. reflector knobs and the Grovers. <laughs> I've never nerded out on guitar knobs before uh, today. This is interesting. I, I know a little about a lot. That, that's me with the period uh, correct Vino album outside of the Hammersmith Apollo. And that is a reissue, Les Paul. That is not an authentic one. Oh, right, right, right. It is an authentic yeah. Gibson, but it's not a, an old one. Um, How about the magazine? Is that the same, the the correct issue? Yeah, nice. What are you talking yeah, dude. I'm sorry. I don't know why. I, I would draw the question. I would draw the question. I would draw the question. I think it's like, think it's like issue like 1134. Don't quote yeah, me. But it's, he's going to know. It's, so, it's, so, it's the one. You, what are you talking about? <laughs> now, did you read it? Do you know the comics in Bino at all? Did you know any of that? I read it once Because I had never heard of it. I have a copy somewhere here in the, you do? In, the in, in the files. Um, break glass in case of emergency. Um, but uh, you know, it, it. I read it along. I, I don't remember what's in it, but I, right. I, I'm not sure Clapton really was reading it when, when the when the photo was taken. It was probably I, I'm tired of this photo shoot, and I like I'd like to go home or to a pub. You know, it's like I pray. That, that's the face that all of us make when we're like, we're we're, we're done with with the camera. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and that Eric Clapton. I don't know. You know, he 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 faults Eric faults himself for breaking up John Mayo's marriage because wow, yeah. Well, Eric talks about that he was apparently quite the 
you know, he was God in England, so he was getting a lot of ladies. And John was married at the time when he brought him in, and then they would carouse together, and that ended up breaking up. That's what I heard. That's that'd from Aaron. That'd, that would be, that'd be two. Patty Boyd as well. Right, exactly. exactly. Which was the style at the time. We could just credit that. Of course. You know? Yeah, and they were friends after that, correct? Same with George Harrison. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying, George Harris. Yeah, I meant the George Harris. You know this, Josh, right? The, the- oh yeah, we Jim Jeffries when we did the, uh, the one of the Beatles records. I think it was a Hard Day's Night, and there's a song about Patty on there, and, and he right. goes, and Jim Jim Jeffries goes, man, that Patty must have had a golden pussy with the amount of songs that were written about her. <laughs> He's like, I mean, dude, it's, but that's what's crazy is that like there's so many of these like people that are in the rock and roll ethos that have inspired like so much music and you know and like like you said it's like george and eric were best friends and he takes his wife i mean and they're still cool like, that's the, the time, craziest right? shit you know god damn dude that would never happen that wouldn't <laughs> in the age of social media now and the way that tmz and the, or even just the 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 magazines in england would have ripped them apart really i'm surprised it probably wasn't even there then Joe, what did you think? This is another sidebar, but it is indirectly related. What did you think of uh, Jeff Healy's take on Hideaway? I loved it. Yeah, I love Jeff Healy. I think he he was such a nice man, and uh, and you know, Angel Eyes and all that stuff that he did yeah, in the eighties, yeah. and, and you know, he doesn't get he doesn't get mentioned in the like the eighties resurgence of blues guitar enough because it's was Stevie was just such a powerful you know, game changer for everyone. Um, I did a gig with Jeff Healy and oh, really? in, okay. in, in uh, Windsor, Ontario at the Windsor Blues and Jazz Fest. And I was so excited. I was opening up for Jeff Healy. I was like, this is going to be great, right? Yeah. This is, he's he's going to play all the shit I want to hear. And he's going to play like, the, like, like, you know, you know, live at the bottom line that WNEW bootleg that was floating around at the time. Fucking great. So I'm waiting around after my show and I see a bunch of horn stands come out. Uh Uh-oh. JHB with the little scrims. I'm like, oh, okay. He's he's got a horn section. I'm like, where's the Marshall? Where's the Black Strat with the Bartolini's? This is weird. (laughs) Then the MC comes on. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Jeff Haley Big Band. And there he is with a fucking trumpet fronting a, a big band orchestra. And I was like, didn't know he had it in him. And I was like, and it was the only time I saw him live before he passed on. He, I played his club and he would be there and, mm-hmm. and I never saw him live with an electric guitar, but I did see him. I did open up for him as, as a big a trumpeter, man, which is astounding. What did he do? Did he do covers? Did he do like jump like blues? Glenn Miller shit. Oh, it was really? like, okay. it was like, like Maynard Ferguson, like all, like yeah, yeah, all yeah. that. Stuff. And you're like, a, he must have had to memorize it because he couldn't sight read it. And, wow. and B, it was astounding that he could play trumpet to that magnitude. But as a, as a, as a band, I was like, where's the guitar, you know, but he, he was a savant level musician. He was another musicologist like Gibbons and all these guys. He was a oh, right. Right. Do you think it hurt him? Or that he was in Roadhouse? I mean, is that a stupid question? <laughs> I don't know. You know, Danny Gatton was on Guiding Light, you know, as a as soap opera. My grandmother used to watch it. And I'm like, there's Danny. You know? <laughs> um, and, it, it, you know, I was I was on the Mickey Mouse Club. Didn't hurt me. No, you, you weren't. Know? Were you really? Yeah. In like 92. Like playing guitar? Yeah. I flew down. Uh, they 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 called because I was like a teenage guitar player. Oh and yeah, right. right. And they said t- they said we'd like to have Joe guest and and play some guitar over a backing track on the Mickey Mouse Club. And uh, being from Utica, New York, and the hometown of Annette Funicello, we go we go yeah. a lot, like have a long history with the Mickey Mouse Club. And I and I came I flew down there with my family and we went to Disney Disney World and it was Orlando and right. they were all there. Justin, Christina, they were all there. And uh, I did one episode and they gave me a little mouse statue, which I still have. Please don't pull it up. Please don't pull it up. <laughs> no, dude, Adam, uh, abort, uh, abort, 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 Adam, abort, abort. There I am. 
Um, <laughs> playing a strat. I, playing a, a custom shop strat that John Page built for me because I got a Fender endorsement when I was 13. And what? Uh, dude, you're shredding, dude. I'm, I'm shredding. They're, they're, and that's you're locked in there. That looks like. Wick yeah, teeth. that's that an Eric Clapton cool. strat with the rosewood neck that they custom built for me. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's me on the Mickey Mouse Club. That fucking, and, but dude, you're, but you it, look, it's, you'll look bad. I, you know, you're young, but dude, you're, you look like you're fucking shredding it. And, and, well, <laughs> here's the problem I was mortified. Yeah. And I, I, I've never watched it. And my, wow. my mother called Heron Cable in Utica, New York, and said, Hey, my son's going to be on the Mickey Mouse Club. And, and they're like, oh, wow, you know what? We've been needing an excuse to do a free Disney Channel weekend. And they put it in the newspaper that local boy is on Mickey Mouse Club. And they gave it away. And 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 they they, they gave a free trial of the Disney yeah. Channel before cable was a bundle. And uh, that it aired on a Saturday night. And I had school on Monday. And my line at the end of the Mickey Mouse Club was, M-I-C, see you real soon. Okay. <laughs> you know, that's how I got my SAG after card. And, uh, and anyway, um, so I come to school eight o'clock in the morning and all the seniors, all the seniors in high school were going, see you real soon. And I was like, (laughs) anyway, part of my, that might not be cool, but check out this, this fresh guitar lick. (laughs) Not many people knew I played. No, what? They knew I would disappear. Not, not, not many people in school knew I played because I didn't, wasn't telling them. And, uh, well, how did they find you? How did the Mickey Mouse Club find you? You know, pre-social media, like yeah. I was on, I was on Real Life with Jane Pauley. I was on, you know, I was a showbiz kid, so people would just right. cold call because we were in the phone book, and th- they would cold call the the my house, and my parents would be like, okay, yeah, he can go to Los Angeles and be on this show or do this, and it was, you know, it was a, it was a, it was kind of a public public interest story at the time going, yeah. you know, there was, there was three of us, maybe four. There was a kid. Uh, I was the kid from upstate New York playing shredding guitar right. at a very young there was age. The harmonica kid, right? There was a, there was a harmonica kid. There was a kid from Jacksonville, Florida named Derek trucks. Um, mm-hmm. And oh. there was a kid from Memphis um, who was a little bit older than the, the both of us. Who's a, still a dear friend, Mr. Eric Gales. And wow. we were all, Kid Shredders. There was a kid named who, guy who plays in my band named Josh Smith from uh, from uh, from Fort La- Lauderdale area. He was he was shredding at a young age, and a kid from Australia named Nathan Cavallari who's still around. And uh, and then I heard about Johnny Lang and Kenny Wayne Shepherd. So we're all kind of this this '90s pre social media. We, we call ourselves the OGs because we didn't have to dance for nickels on uh, on on Instagram to get to get known. We just people would just call and, and we'd get these opportunities and, and that was it. So I forgot you had a producer. You pulled up it. I think it's, I think it's awesome, man. It, it's, it's fucking, it's awesome. It's it, what I find fascinating. It's the same way with Wayne, why I love having you on and, and Joe, like, you know, anytime we have a blues artist that you love, please, I would love to have this over again because it, it's like when it. you're, yeah, because it's like, dude, it's like, it's such, you know, it's when when you find something that you're just interested about and find something that's also like so fucking cool. Like there's something about blues and it's also probably one of the most, it's the most American music, that and jazz. You know what I mean? It's like, are the two great American art forms? And, you know, it, it's it's for me, for someone, it's like who, who loves music but doesn't know you know, the backstory of, of really where it all came from. It's like, it's just, it's, it's awesome. And and to see not only are you a student and also an artist of it, but you've been a student since you were a kid, that is what makes it even that much sweeter. I think of being yeah, able to sit here and talk to you. Well, it's, it's really a, just a, it's just, you know, what we did and it was a means to an end. It was better than a paper wrap. You know, it was, yeah. I, it was making money. I was, you know, was, I was a, you know, we we're doing gigs, really? getting paid. And, okay. and okay, when did you know as a kid, this is another sidebar, that you like had a like a talent for it? Like you were like, oh, I think I can I actually can play these licks and stuff. My dad would hear me practice in our our, our my childhood home, you mm-hmm. know, was 900 square feet. Okay, it was a thousand, maybe a thousand square feet. So I would be practicing in my bedroom and then I get a knock on the door from my dad. He's like, play that again. Play that again. 
and then he took me to a guitar teacher and you know and then they would wad dire me and 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 whatever and and they're like he's kind of weirdly That's good right. and right. i remember in third grade uh my music teacher that they were like um they were they were doing a, they, they would teach guitar uh in mm -hmm. fourth grade and so she brought out a guitar and said like, next year kids we're gonna we're gonna learn some guitar does anybody know any how to play any guitar <laughs> and my best friend who knew i played narked on me right so he's like joe plays and here we go right so she's like why don't you come play something for the class and i'm like no no and then of course oh. 30 kids are like baiting me so then i went up there and i just learned this song from steve ray vaughn called scuttle button and yeah yeah that's all instrumental. that's all instrumental that's all instrumental, instrumental right yeah. And I started playing it. And the music teacher, Mrs. Whitehill, Ray runs out of the room, <laughs> runs out of the room, gets the high school band teacher and brings him in. She goes, play that again. I'm like, oh, God, you know, and uh, it, gets the, it gets to the principal. Now, the principal's calling the house going, Do you know, yeah. Joe plays guitar really well. They're like, Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, all this trouble. But it did buy me cachet. And I said, Okay, they're not picking on me anymore, which is good. All right, and that's yeah. and that's, and you know, I started my career at, at eleven, so now I'm forty-seven, so thirty-six years um, doing Fuck. professionally, and and it, it's you know, it's just a thing. I I I I can never listen to myself and think I'm any good, but I think that's a good thing about yourself is is you never no. never listen to yourself. Yeah. There's a couple of things I go, okay, that, that I'm glad I hit that, but there's a couple of things you go, you know, if, but if you can listen, if you listen to yourself and go, oh my God, that's the best damn guitar lick I ever heard. Then, then, then there's some, then there's some ego issues. Um, but if you listen to yourself and go, you know what, I can always get better. That's, that's really the, 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 the high watermark of, of bettering right. yourself. Well, can yeah. I say, this is what I say. This is what I say about guitar players: is the ones I I think connect are the ones that make the audience feel, as opposed to just are amazed by the virtuosity. That's my opinion. Well, yeah, and and you got to be an entertainer. BB King taught me right. that when I was very very young. He goes, Joe, I'm an entertainer. I play guitar and I sing, but I'm an entertainer. Right. And and buddy guy, same same lesson. And Buddy guy walks out there to this day. He's 88 years old and BB, same thing. All they do is walk out and shoot the audience a glance and smile. And they stand up and I go, work smarter, not harder. And mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's the suit guy. The suit guy is the character. And I walk out there and I don't have to play anything. Exactly. And they, and they, they applaud and you engage one at a time, just like being in comedy, you engage right. one at a time, you're playing to an audience of one. And if you got that person, you got the rest, you know, and yeah. never, show, never show fear because what you guys do is so much harder than what I do. I can hold a note for 12 bars and people applaud. You know, you bomb two yeah. jokes in a row. It's a long 15 it minutes. It's comedy. It's, it's, and you can also you can also practice as, as you practice hours and hours and hours a day exactly what you're going to play on stage. But we have to be in front of an audience to get that reaction to know because we can think it's funny, but we don't know it's funny until we hear the, the actual laughter. So but yeah, dude, I completely if we at all doubt ourselves, I mean, it's just like they read it so quickly. And they and it's love this way if it's in Australia, it's the other way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's there's nights that we go up there and it's like it's like you know, like hit the mic going, is this fucking thing on? Like it's like we're killing really it. Am. And then there's nights that we think as a band, it's like, oh, we're off and, and it's you know, it's not the same every night. That's why I love touring yeah. is because you get to start at zero every day. And people go, I mean, I've seen like 40 shows of yours, and it's like that was the best I've ever heard you play. I'm like, Whoa okay really yeah 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 you just got to trust the force you know you just got to trust the process you know it's, it's there's it. a baseline of your best show and your worst show is about five percent you know difference and wow you know, if, 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 if you if you don't fuck up and fuck yourself up where is there so i want to say this where is where was the show for you where was the one that that hit on you were firing on every cylinder where you walked off and were like wow like I, I feel not and not, not ego just you really it was like i don't think i've i i can ever play as well as i did in that moment again two two, two of my best shows 
three. I'll give you the three. And then thank God the cameras were on. Okay. My yeah. best show, I always tell people my best show ever was when we did Muddy Wolf at Red Rocks the first time. Wow. 2014. What a great place. So, and it was like, right. yeah, that was the second. 10 years ago. That's 10 years ago year. now. Uh, yeah. Second was 2009 Royal Albert Hall. All uh, the, all the stars aligned uh, yeah. and Clapton came out. And that was, that was amazing. I didn't realize it at the time because I was just paralyzed with fear. It was the beginning of the beginning or the beginning of the end. I knew that, you know. Really? Right. That's when you did further on up the road? And I knew my entire future was on the line. I said, if this thing... For that song drinks, or for that concert? For the whole performance. You know, right. all the press was there. I was getting a lot of hype in the in the UK, drawing a big crowd. And we finally did the Albert Hall, sold it out. And I walked out there. I was like, holy crap, I pulled this off. Now I got to deliver. So that, luckily we did. And third... Um, would be a second night of Carnegie Hall, the acoustic tour. That's, I think, one of my best performances. Um, and 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 luckily the cameras were on all three times. So. Oh, that's awesome. And then there, and then there's and then there's Davenport, Iowa. We killed it in Davenport. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. So he's like, it's like you get yeah, Royal Albert Hall. Yeah. The, the top of Mount we'll Masada. Go. <laughs> and the and the, and the, the Walgreens party, yeah. yeah, we killed. Yeah, <laughs> so Joe, what would you people. say to a musician or a young somebody who's just into music? Why the Beano album is important, and you might want to give it a listen. Yeah, because whether again, whether you like blues rock or not, mm -hmm. um, and it really is the the the. The building blocks of Zeppelin and and all the stuff that we listen to, heavy blues, and right. you have to you have to appreciate the forward thinking of it, and and the, the 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 mastery of the people in the room, and and you know having to fight the engineer, having to go against the grain to create something that the sound of your in in your head, you know that that comes out. And you go, I, I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what the doubters say. I don't, I don't want to hear what the, the, the engineer in the, in the white, you know, coat says about the way I turn the amp up or the, the song selection or whatever. I'm going to do this, you know, and, and do or die. And that's a good lesson for anyone um, in music or in any creative uh, art form is, is, you know, the Mavericks tend to win big, but they also bet it all. And, and, and if you bet it all, and you're in your gut conviction it's it's it, it that's a that's a winning combination playing it safe it it tends to come and go until you don't play it safe and i've been guilty of playing it safe and and luckily my producer kevin shirley constantly mm -hmm. even now pokes the bear and he's like he's like come on you you got better in you and 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 that's wow that's really sing higher you got the note Say, do this. You got this. You know, and you need you need that impetus to keep pushing the the the, the line up. You know. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Wayne, do you have any other questions you want to ask? No, uh, no, Joe no. Or, no, anything? or like, yeah. I, yeah. No, I, I, dude, I, we could keep going, but it's like I don't want to keep everybody. This was so great. I want to ask the same questions you already asked. The final question, what I would, which I would always ask, which is like, why should everybody listen to this? But I'm, I'm curious to get both of your reactions of the other stuff. What are your favorite songs on this record? What's your favorite song? Uh, me, Double Crossing oh, Time. Double Cross. Now, what is it that you love uh, about Double Cross Time more than the others? It just it just sticks with you from a young yeah. age, or the, the solo. Yeah, so, it's a crazy good. And on the and on the floor, you know what I mean. He's playing with the band. The tone is. I chased that sound my whole life and never got there. And, and 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 John as a singer, try to cover John Mayall's voice in the same keys. He had an incredibly good voice, an incredibly high singer. And, uh, you know, his his version of So Many Roads uh, off the Hard Road record with Peter Green, stratospheric vocal. And, you know, that's a blues band at apex curve, double crossing time, in my opinion, an English blues band. Dude, I gotta re-listen to that song now because I, I I know what you're talking about, but it's like it's to know that it's that important. Wayne, what about you? Um, I, this is gonna sound weird, but I like Hideaway. It's an instrumental, and I just I what I like about it is it's a showcase for multiple 
styles of guitar playing in one song. And I, it just really moves. I mean, the whole album's ridiculous with the exception of a drum solo. Is this, is this one of your both like favorite guitar, like not guitar records, but yeah, guitar records. Is this like, you know, I, would you, would you, is this in your top 10, top 20, top five somewhere? No. Top five. Top sure. five for you. Yeah. 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 Wait. For Joe, it would be not for me. It's not, again, it's, I, I listen much more to Cream than I do this album. I listen much more to Led Zeppelin than I do this. I listen to Truth more than I do this album. So it's just, but all, again, but this is the basis of it all. This is the first time literally Les Paul into a Marshall. Like mm -hmm. it happened and that happened and it was recorded. And some weird kid from Surrey, like just like playing his, just, what would you say? He's almost like he's channeling BB King and Freddie King and Albert, all of these guys through his fingers. Buddy guy, you know. and, and, buddy well, guy, yeah, yeah. I, I I always like when 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 cats throw a grenade on the blues, yeah, and take take the heat. You know, every ten years somebody throws a grenade on the blues, and and right. last time it was done was Gary Clark Jr. and you know now it's Kingfish. Throw a grenade on it, blow it up, rebuild it, right. And yeah. and because you can't just keep going back to, you know, could could I just, you know, study the Beano album and recreate it? Yeah. Why? We have it. You know, yeah. don't do sound alikes. Throw a grenade. And that's this, the, the Beano album and John and Clapton and that that confluence of people threw a grenade on the blues. And we're still talking about it and listening to it. And and yeah can hear the DNA and, and, and the, and the intent in Zeppelin and then, and even in black Sabbath, you know, no all this question. stuff would be sounding way different if it wasn't for that. Wow. Wow. I love that. Um, all right. I, I, I hate him to ask this. Can someone have sex to this record? I ask that question. Every minute. It's like, how do you do that in this moment? But I know if I don't, my fans are going to be like, Josh, you didn't ask the question. Can you fuck to this record guys? Can you, I the blues. I feel like you can. It's very sexy in its way, but is it just for you guys? Probably not because you're paying attention to the guitar solos too much. And that would keep you out of the game. Maybe rambling on my mind. What do you think? Maybe um, being slightly on the spectrum. And <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I, have, I have a hard time. I, I got to concentrate <laughs> on one thing at a time. Okay. It's, 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 you know. It's like, oh, check out that tone. Oh, what, what am I doing? You know, you can't do that. I've lost my erection. I, uh, yeah, yeah. I can't, <laughs> dude. Exactly. You know. I have to ask, uh, guys. This was such a gift, man, to have both of you on here, Wayne. Thank I, you, you know how much me. I love you. Oh, Joe, Thanks. please, dude. I want you. You, I know you're in LA. I want you more than anything. And Wayne, you, I'll have make sure you're there and on the show too. I want you to do the goddamn comedy jam, which is the music comedy show I do at the comedy store, where we've had like you know Tom Morello's come by, and we've had we've had uh, you know Tommy Lee, just a different many rock stars just show up to play. But it's comics. It's basically a rock concert where comics do stand up and then perform a song with my band. But I would love you to 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 come in and jam a blues song with Mark Marin because he's. I don't know if you ever talked to him. You probably yeah, have, I'm right? But I, I know, I know, I always know him. Dude, yeah. he yeah. is such a blues fan, and he's so good at guitar, and he loves the you know the sound and everything that you're talking about. We've done like we've done some Freddie King stuff before, or even like what he'll do is this is a funny story. The first time he did the show, I was like, dude, so, you know, I explained the show and he goes, all right, yeah, I'll do a Rolling Stones song. And I'm like, great, we'll do like Symphony or like Gimme Shelter, like one of the popular ones. He goes, he goes, yeah, I don't know if I want to do that. I, I was like, well, you know, you want to do something the audience knows. And he goes, yeah, I could give a fuck about the audience. He goes, I want to do this 1960s Japanese only re release Little Red Rooster. And oh. yeah, so... So to give you an idea, like, and, and we did that, and then he did Symphony. But you're, dude, just to be able to jam with you, it's I'm like, in. I yeah, dude, we'll, no, this we'll, is gonna happen. This is, gonna I know happen. it's gonna happen. I'll talk to Mark. It'll probably, are you on tour in October? Uh, not the beginning of October, at the end. The end. Fuck. Ah, fuck. All right, we're the. I think we're the end of October. But I'll, I'll stay in touch. We'll get dates. We'll make this work, and it'll fucking rule. Yeah, uh, I'll, 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 I'll give you my number in the little chat area. So you perfect. Just, just, just call me. Perfect. Promote away, yeah. guys. Like, uh, like Joe, what do you have going on? Just whatever you want to promote, please take it, you know, say it all. Um, 
the next the next thing I we we have a tour starting at the end of October, as I just said. Um, but the, but the, but the next the next thing I'm doing is uh, uh, something that's near and dear to my heart here in Los Angeles is on Sunday. I don't know when this airs, but but this Sunday, um, uh, a bunch of us through Norm's Rare Guitars are getting together, and we're doing a a, 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 a benefit for the Midnight Mission, which is a homeless uh, outreach here in LA. And and I you know I. For me, charity always starts at home, and we have a big problem here in Los Angeles. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, so so we're doing that. It's Jackson Brown, and it's Vince Gill, and Albert Lee, Dude. and and wow. everybody playing this little place called the Write Off Room on Ventura Boulevard. And you know what? It's 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 for a good cause, and we raise a lot of money, and and uh, and and they do they do help people get off the streets. And there's so that's 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 the next. They Thing I'm doing. And the write off room, I've done a show there before. There used to be a comedy show. It's a really good little mm -hmm. venue off of Ventura, like by like Woodland Hills, right? They moved it actually closer to me. It's actually in Studio City now, which is even better. I don't have to drive. Oh, right on. I dude, that's awesome, man. And and I, listen, I will reach out. Wayne, please uh promote away. Well, Welcome. I'm I what's coming out, it's not gonna come out till next year, but I'm working on an HB producing this HBO documentary on Mel Brooks, two parter. Judd Apatow's directing, so that's that's kind of what I'm doing, and then just doing stupid gigs around town. Nothing anyone has to say. It's never stupid, <laughs> Wayne. We'll have you back on, Joe. We'll have you back on. Thank you guys. Thank Thanks, you so John, much. I really dude. appreciate it. Oh, this was, dude. This was so great. This was so great.